I have learned and whatever I have shamelessly lifted from others' experiences here. Uh, I think what a day it has been uh, since the morning. Uh, we talked about the social change. Uh, and I think one of the things about social change is, uh, is something that I want to just carry on in this session here. Uh, the first thing is really about the credibility, establishing the credibility. Second is understanding the emotional aspect of change. One of the things, at least it's been my pet peeve, uh, many a times we actually talk about the change in the context of, so try to, try to imagine the iceberg and the change iceberg really, when we talk about the visual aspect of it, the rituals, the artifacts, the processes, the control processes, the checks and balances of any process, we talk about those visual aspects of what really meets the eye. But the emotional aspect of change is really all about the hidden piece, the invisible piece of the iceberg that's submerged under the icy waters. And that is really the, the, the essence of change. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about those, those elements of it here. Now I realize that I have just 30 minutes, I want to keep a couple of minutes for interaction, so I will not be able to take a, you through the entire detailed journey here, but I will try to do justice to whatever makes sense. Uh, this is a wonderful picture of last 11,000 years of uh, biological evolution and human evolution. And one of the things very remarkable, remarkable about this picture is, as, as you can see here, that it actually starts from minus uh, or rather 9000 BC and you see it's rather flattish up until actually almost the start, it's, it's almost like the Isaac Asimov, uh, the, the, the calendar of evolution kind of a thing actually if you will. And what we see here is a, it's not even a hockey stick, it actually just takes off like, a, like, like the F-16 takes off in a Cobra maneuver kind of a thing there and what happens is, what we see here is that the the changes that are happening and the, and, and the pace of change is just getting faster and faster all the time. What does it mean to us? Let's, let's try to see that. And one of the things about pace of change is that it's not just limited to the rocket science or, the, or, the, or, or decoding the human GNA and stuff like that. Even stuff like the crayons that my child and your children have used, 100 years back in 1903, there were only 8 colors of Crayola crayons. Today there are 120 colors of it. How many of us can name them? There's actually a test on the net. Men are only able to name purple, pink, blue, red, white, green. Women can name two dozen of them. <laughs> the point is, there is so much of changes happening around us and we need to understand we cannot just ignore uh, what's, what's really happening there. So, the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is change is, we, we always talk about change as something threatening, but you know what? Change is, in my way, it's like normal actually, because we get up in the morning and right from the first, first breath of fresh air we take, right from all the things that we start doing to get up early uh, to the office, beat the traffic there, there is a change happening everywhere. There's all kind of changes happening around us and, and we need to be aware of them and we need to understand what is really happening. So it seems like change is normal. There is nothing abnormal about it, right? So what is the problem then? The problem is, People resist change. And we are going to talk a little about why, why, why do they really resist changes. And that is the, that is the issue there that, that uh, we need to understand there. Why do people resist changes? There seem to be millions of reasons for that. I have just written down a couple of reasons here. The FUD, the, the, the famous fear, uncertainty and doubt, which really forces people into a panic mode, pushes them up the wall and say, okay, I'm, oh my goodness, what am I going to do there? I'm not really prepared for this kind of a change. Uh, and then some of us are really very happy being in the comfort zone. We, we really would like to rather much sit, uh, sit, sit there and, and do nothing about it. And then there are few of us who really have legitimate concerns about changes. Oh, okay, wh what you are saying is, so what does it mean is that the global warming is really going to do so and so. I mean, they, they really try to put a lot, lot of logic and analysis behind it. Uh, it is also a concern because many a times it's an indictment of the past practices. So what do you mean is when I say, I have not been doing code reviews here. What you are saying is that I have really been, you know what, garbage in, garbage out kind of a thing. I have just been letting, letting the whole world be my beta tester, that kind of a thing. Uh, and then we are victims of old habits. We are all used to it. We are so comfortable around them. We know, okay, that's how I have been doing stuff. Let me not change it. Why do I really do that? There could be legitimate, legitimate issues around it because there could be a drop in productivity. There could be a drop in performance because of changing over from old habits to the new habits. But then that's besides the point. So, so th these are some of the reasons why people ch uh, uh, resist changes. Uh, 
the, the scholars call it homeostasis is one of, the, uh, one of the human abilities of really resisting the change here. But what do people do as a result of that? And, and we all human, human beings are wonderful creatures. We respond to those changes, we respond to those, uh, we, we express our resistance in beautiful ways. We disagree, which is a more polite way of saying that I don't like this change. We procrastinate, which is a socially acceptable way of saying that I don't like it. We push back, many a times pushback is a desirable trait in people. Uh, we deny like the proverbial ostrich burying its head in the, uh, in the, in the sand. We outrightly reject it and say, no, this is not going to work. We refuse like the proverbial dinosaur and who says, change, you can't get it from me, right? We resist because we don't, don't like that change. Uh, and sometimes in exceptional circumstances, some of us do sabotage the changes also, right? Now, for the rest of the presentation, I would just like you to think about any personal or professional change that you are going through at this point in time in your mind. And you don't need to talk about that, but just keep that in the back of the mind because we are trying to we're trying to go through the anatomy of that change process and say what really goes on with, at, at each of the steps. And I'd like you to just kind of uh, go through that in your mind. So, when, uh, so what happens is people are resisting about uh, those changes in all uh, shapes and forms. But what do we do instead of that? Instead of really uh, addressing it, we tell people it's my way or it's highway. Right? So we tell the people as a good corporate citizen, you are expected to comply with what the organization is going through because that's in the right interest of the shareholders, theory E or theory E, what, I mean theory E when we look at it. And you need to make sure that we maximize the shareholder return so we just change is required, blah, blah, blah. And so be quiet, just, just go and do those changes. If you don't like the changes, you're most, you're most welcome to leave. So those are, those are really the challenges there. The, the challenge is really how do we bring about the change that we can believe in and that's the, the biggest problem for any, any kind of leader or an individual or any person who has a role to play in the, in the organization. My role, uh, in my current role at Yahoo, I am responsible for agile adoption across our Bangalore center. Uh, Yahoo is a, is a company that you all know. It's highly democrat, uh, democratic company. Uh, change in a initiative is something which you, the first thing is we need to make sure that we are able to establish credibility at the door. If I'm not able to establish credibility at the door, not about my process or ideas, I'll also get thrown out. That's as simple as that. It's as, gr as brutal as it gets. How do I establish credibility in a highly decentralized organization? I, ca I need to be a change agent. I need to really understand there is no top-down mandate that's going to work there. So it's, it's something which I have to really build a consensus. I have to build the coalition for change and really bring all those uh, uh, issues there. So let's, let's try and understand what is change. I'm not going to define and give a bookish definition here, but this is something which I, I picked up from Visual Thesaurus. Uh, and a lot of words here really are, are about what does change mean to people. So, so, so stuff like uh, it's, uh, it's something is varying or something is modify, getting modified, something is altering, some uh, transfer, uh, shift from, from what we are doing, conversion, commute, interchange, exchange. So these are Various, it's like the six blind men and the elephant. Everyone sees change from their own perspective. So let's not try and define one single definition. All let's say is it is a change or a modification or an alteration from what we have doing, what we have been doing so far to what we are going to do now. So uh, let let's just start with that. Most of us have some myths about changes, and we all truly believe these are the mental models that we have all grown up with. Depending on the cultural context, depending on the uh, family values and the norms that we share, depending on the kind of environment that we have grown with, we get to live and grow with those mental models. And those are some of the, uh, the myths as I call them. Uh, and those myths actually end up creating a kind of a cross for say, you say and say no change, change should not be, change is not the good idea, right? But the way I look at those uh, uh, things is that the reality actually is much different. The change to me is something that protects us. The change is the new normal. Uh, it's, it's not something which uh, is, is necessarily the bad thing. Uh, change makes us better. Uh, change creates options. Many people say change, with change you don't have an option. But to me change is an option available which, which opens opportunities. Change enables us to do more and more uh, things. Change is not a one-time event that you really are, you are done with. It's, it's, it's an ongoing process. Uh, change is a progress and, and, and change is not really uh, um, change is creative it's, and change is not absolute or final, it's really related because we are always undergoing changes all the time. Um, change is actually giving an opportunity for rebirth. Look at it this way, if we were not allowed to change and if the only destiny for what we were doing was the end, 
then we would not get a second opportunity. So in a way, it's like a second birth available to you free of cost, right? And a and, and lot of people have really poured their wisdom in these quotations, which uh, uh, I like some of them here. The second one, especially, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. Uh, and, and, and Deming's famous statement, it's not necessary to change, survival is not mandatory. So I think it's important, I think the agenda is pretty well set in terms of uh, why do we really need to change. So the question is, is change really good? And, and uh, the, the point is really how you look at it, but the way I look at it is, uh, and I picked this up from uh, uh, US composer John Cage, I cannot understand why people are frightened of new ideas. I'm frightened of the old ones. And I think that itself in a way summarizes why the change is required for us. Uh, is change bad? Gary Hamill, the famous uh, professor of uh, management, uh, just the last line important, are we changing as fast as the world around us? And we saw the graphic there, the world is really uh, on an upswing at this point in time. The question is, are we really, uh, is there an impedance mismatch between the way the world is changing and between the way our thought process is changing? Does it matter? Does it matter that we need to change around us? Uh, I think it's important. Uh, more than 100 years or 150 years back, Robert Wood Johnson, the, uh, one of the three brothers of Johnson & Johnson co-founder, he, he said, I'm very interested in the future because I plan to spend the rest of my life there. What more could be a better compelling reason for you to change, right? So, um, so I, I'll briefly go over some of the change models that I've used and I use in my process. Some of them are individual uh, change uh, that we talk about. Some of them are organizational change models. Uh, when I look at why is it relevant for we agile practitioners, uh, one of the things about agile is um, we look at agile as actually a primarily a development process change. To me, agile is actually a sociological process change. It is not just limited to how we do coding. It is not limited to how we write, uh, we create an MVP. It is not limited to how we do stand-ups. To me, these are actually, as, as far as I'm concerned, I can throw them out of the door. What is more important is how my sociological equations and dynamics are really changing because of embracing a certain different way of doing things. End of the day, and, and I, I, think, I, I think all of us, I, I think software industry would be a much better place if instead of computer science, we all went to sociology classes. I, I truly believe in that. So, so going ahead on that, um, let me start with that. The first model here, um, I, I'll briefly go over. So Virginia Satter, she actually created this change model. Some of you have seen this one. But the whole idea here is actually, so what happens is we all are in our comfort zones. I talked about the comfort zone, which, I, which we can call is actually the, the late status quo. So we are already, we have slipped into that comfort zone and suddenly what happens is this foreign element comes there. And try to think of foreign element exactly as the way human body works. Uh, when, as a student of organization behavior, when we read about organizations, we learn that organizations are actually organisms. And like any physical living organism, it has a tendency to self-preserve itself. It has a tendency that if there is a foreign element that comes in, there is what we know as the organ reject kind of a thing happening there. So, so the antibodies are produced and we tend to throw it out there. So the opposition also grows up to match up the amount of uh, uh, threat that is there, right? So the foreign element comes and then there is a resistance. There is a period of resistance because it has changed in the way, the, the, the way we have done business, right? And, that, and then the performance curve really comes down because we are really struggling with what is happening. We have no clue at this point in time. And, and, and chaos... Uh, uh, happens right after that and it goes on for some time at some point in time uh, whether because of people's effort or serendipity or one of these better reasons there is a transforming idea that germinates uh, and and that is really able to start creating the foundation for integration and that starts taking the curve up ahead so and and then over a period of time when the integration has happened we are able to establish the new status quo now it sounds uh, simpler said than done but this is in a way a very simplistic model of the change that, that is happening inside each one of us, whether it is the first thing in the morning when we get up and we don't see uh, the newspaper at the doorstep or, or we see that somebody has moved my cheese or something or, or, or any other major kind of a change that we are talking about. We go through this kind of a conflicting process and the success of a change really depends on our ability to really climb up the hockey curve there. Because at the time of chaos and during integration also there is a tendency for people to slip back into the old habits and that is really the, the, the biggest challenge that we have. Now, if you are a person who is leading that change for your team members, or even you are undergoing that kind of a change, uh, just a few prescriptions that are available there in terms of how uh, uh, people can really get help. Uh, I'll not go into that, but slides will be available uh, for later viewing. Uh, there is another very beautiful model. Uh, Kubler-Ross was actually a Swiss uh, doctor, and she studied terminally ill patients. 
in, in 50s and 60s. She studied more than 500 people who eventually died, actually. And one of the things that, that she found as a process of that was that people undergo what is now famously known as the Kubler-Ross grief cycle. And we all actually uh, go through that uh, in various uh, stages. And the whole idea is when the, when the, when the initial news is, is given to people, uh, uh, the, again, the, 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 the res emotional response which is, is active tends to go down there and, and there is a period from stability to the immobilization. There is an immediate numbness. Many of you are, are, must be following Yuvraj uh, Singh, the cricketer at this point in time. Try, just try to see what happened or try to see what Steve Jobs probably went through. Just try to put that in that. When he, when he talked about the initial 18 months where he denied that, that's the next phase coming here. You deny that, no, this is not happening to me. And that's exactly what happens to, 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 to people there. Then there is anger. Why me? I did not smoke, I did not drink, I did not do anything that would create uh, or enter carcinogenics in my body. Why only me? And that's, that's really the, the, the difficult part over there. And then we start bargaining. Okay, why not this time? Okay, I'll leave this thing, I'll do something else. What if I just get yet another chance there, right? So we start bargaining there. And then after that, get into depression because by the time we have started to understand that uh, it's, it's not going to be as simple as it sounds. And then uh, at some point in time, then we start saying, okay, I have to live with that. Uh, I'm moving to, uh, towards the acceptance phase. Start looking at testing that and look at some realistic solutions there. So this is how the entire process is going. The original process is the one that is in the green boxes. Uh, this source uh, I picked up from, uh, the author has created two more additional blue boxes there. That's why there are seven, but the initial phase was. So the whole idea is, now try to look at any of the changes that would have happened in your personal and professional life. Anything meaningful has probably gone through this. The amount of time could vary from one to other, but it really is that we go through these kind of steps of life. I mean, I can imagine when, 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 when my boss would tell me that, no, your performance is not good this time, the immediate reaction is denial. No, I have done that. See, look at it. I'll send you the mails. I'll send you all the stuff. I have done that. I, I checked in the code yesterday. That, that guy broke it, you know. He's the guy who's the culprit. We always look at those kind of things. But the reality is, that's how people are undergoing the changes. If you are a people manager, if you are a coach, if you are a friend to somebody, the, the most important thing is to really understand and recognize that somebody else is actually going through this cycle. It's not a single, it's not a switch that I can flip and say, you know what, until yesterday it was not a Y2K, now it is Y2K. So it, until, until yesterday I was X and now I've become Y. It is not like that. It's a fuzzy state. It's, it's a transition, it's a gradual transition that is happening there. And at each stage there is a danger of people slipping back into uh, the previous cycle. This, there is more work done on uh, this uh, Kubler-Ross cycle which is known as the theory of transitions. Transitions actually, so Kubler-Ross was really about the negative news, how, how people look at the negative changes. The transitions theory is really about even the positive effect. Very, very, quite often we actually talk colloquially about honeymoon effect and this, this actually talks about that honeymoon effect is actually a valid thing. So even the positive things actually wear off, they tend to taper off at some point in time because there is only this much, that the, so that's why one of the things that we, we keep hearing about is you, you pay bonuses, you give salary hikes to people to improve their performance in the cognitive sciences and guess what, over a period of time, it doesn't help. Over a period of time, it is law of diminishing returns that's applying to us. So, so this is a kind of a graph that actually explains you and it, it, it helps you align and what, what this author argues is that over a period of our life, we typically go through 10 to 20 of these major transitions in our life, whether it is professional or personal. And each one of them lasts from anything between six to eight months or 10 months. And people go through these cycles, whether it is good or bad. And this is how the human uh, reactions really change. Now, these were about the individual changes. Kurt Levin has done a lot of study on how the sociological systems, cultures, societies, teams uh, really grapple with changes. And one of the things that he has come up with what is known as the force field, ana force field analysis. And what he says is that it is, the, it is the tendency of every system to stay in the equilibrium. And what is equilibrium is actually when the, when the uh, driving forces and the restraining forces are in balance. And that is really the, the steady state that we are talking about here. If we want to move from a current state which is in equilibrium to another desired stage, then we, it's not going to be so simple. One of the natural tendencies that we have, I mean, try to think of one of the changes that you were trying to impose upon somebody, right? I mean, if my son doesn't study, I say, okay, no, no more Facebook for you, or no more uh, mobile for you, or no more PSP for you, you go and study there, right? Guess what? He invents more creative ways of finding the resistance. So what really happens is, 
uh, that instead of really, so if, if, if I'm just trying to, uh, to, to actually move the driving forces up, even the resistive forces are coming up. So the change is not happening, right? So, so, so to really bring about the change, we have to go through a three-step process, what is known as unfreeze, change, and then once again refreeze model. So if you see here, what is happening is before change, in the current conditions, there is a, there is a sense of equilibrium. Now try to think of it, some of you who have, who have been aware with uh, some of the Indian changes that we are going through, like Anna Hazare movement. Try to look at it, look at any parliament of any, any democracy, there is a government and there is an opposition and they have a creative tension between them, right? And that is what is really the equilibrium that is bringing there. Now try to think of, the government wants to bring a new legislation. The government wants to lower the taxes or, or raise the taxes or whatever they would like to do that. There is a driving forces, there is a lot of lobbying happening there, there is a lot of uh, uh, pitch in the media there, people start really raising the stakes and say, okay, I need to, we need to bring this change, people talk about it, there are focus groups and all kinds of things. And at the same time, if they do not really start diminishing the restraining forces, what happens is the diminishing forces also rise up uh, commensurate to the, to the intensity of the driving forces and that really defeats the purpose. So the whole idea is we have to unfreeze the current equilibrium, make the changes and then refreeze them. We have to lock it again them. It, in an organizational context, for example, you need to lock in with uh, enough amount of institutionalization. Uh, in a large company, the institutionalization could be in terms of bonus that is linked to your new behaviors, for example. So unless you really ex uh, uh, display those behaviors, you are not going to get uh, money at the end of the rainbow. So you, you need to make sure that you are exhibiting them, right? So, but this is, a, this is a great reference model that really tells more dynamics of what it really is, is, is uh, it's, it's not a seamless process, there are multiple things happening there. There's a famous book, The Perfect Change, and uh, from Proce, and, and, and this is the ADKR model that talks about, in the organizational context, a couple of things, I'll not spend too much time here, but I'll just, a uh, couple of things that I want to bring about is, in, a, in an organizational context, there are five phases that this, this author talks about, awareness, desire, knowledge, uh, ability, and reinforcement. And one of, the, one of the things that we don't understand when we are talking about change in an organizational context is the time it takes for an individual to go through similar change is different for different people. Not all of us are cut from the same die. We all require different time, different amount of time to immerse ourselves, to validate our own assumptions, to make sure that our concerns that we have are addressed adequately and then we are able to move on there. So, while it could take somebody just five days to really go through that process, it might take me 15 days to go through that. I cannot really be having, um, uh, uh, I mean, I need to have a different uh, strokes for different folks kind of strategy over there. Uh, but, but the problem is if the change model do not really treat the organization in the same way and they treat that as a monolith, then we are going to run into a problem. It's exactly like the kindergarten or the school after that because the teacher decides now every child will move to the chapter six and every child has to move to the chapter six irrespective of their abilities and motivation about it, right? And the other important thing about in the organizational context is in a large organization, even in a small organization, information does not go to or reach people all at the same time. With all the technical advancements we have made with internet and Twitter and, 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 and all the updates that are available to people, guess what? It is not that we all discover information at the same time. There are some of us who will discover it in the restrooms, there are some of us who will discover it in the hallways, and there, then there are some of us who will go back to the organizational intranet and try and figure out what is really happening there. And some of us will, will really wait for the official communication. What is important to understand is an, an organizational change initiative that's going to just rely on this assumption is really going to fall flat because it's not the way people look at the changes. And, and to really make the change effective, what we need to understand is that the successful change is going to happen on two dimensions. One is the business, one is on the people. On the business dimensions, uh, people understand uh, about the, the various aspects of it. On the people aspect is the key issue, how we are really going through it. Uh, so, so this is uh, the context there. Now, many of us, you would have seen that it is really a leadership, the situational leadership model, which is talked about in the context of the, the, the Blanchard-Hershey model. I, I try to look at it also as a change model, actually, because this is also the way you actually are helping your team members undergo a change. Now, this change in this particular case actually could be related to how the skills are advancing in their own day-to-day uh, -day life and how you as a manager or a leader is actually playing the role in terms of empowering them, in terms of decentralizing it, in terms of really making sure that you're not micromanaging their day-to-day -day behavior and, and you're, you're really taking off and giving them a long rope. So, so that's uh, uh, one of the ways in which we actually go. So if you see from quadrant S1, S2, S3, S4, the way the manager is really from a directing behavior goes to coaching behavior, supporting and, and finally delegating behavior. 
in, in, in the context of Agile, we definitely see the roles are changing there. And, and, and I think uh, even though Agile explicitly doesn't talk about the role of a manager, I, I personally think the role of manager is even more than ever before because people are actually going through a lot of changes which are dramatically different from what they were used to. The reason being in the old, good old control and com command and control, top-down world, somebody was telling them what to do. Now they are left to fend for themselves. And unless they really get the right level of support and coaching there, not all of us are smart enough to figure out how, what is my, what's going to be my next step. So I think, I think there is a role uh, to be followed there. Uh, this is really at the large organizational change. Uh, John Cotter, the world's foremost authority on changes, uh, the Harvard business professor, uh, has written wonderful books on that, has talked about this eight step process there. Uh, but this is really in the context of leading a large organizational change. Uh, so now the question comes is we talked about so many things about well, how do people go through the change? What's the anatomy of the change? What is really a chronological cycle of a change there? What can you do about it? The question comes, can we anticipate or predict changes? Somebody might say, you know what? I, I understand all this, but can we really predict? It's like predicting an earthquake. Can I really predict an earthquake, right? Or can I predict some, some other uh, natural phenomena? Can I predict a tsunami? Now, guess what? Uh, now, let's, let's see some viewpoints about it. So Niels Bohr said, prediction is very difficult if it is about the future, right? And that's, that's kind of uh, sums up our mindset about prediction. Uh, but, but I think there, is, there are multiple thoughts about it. The more you think about it in terms of if you anticipate the difficult, uh, you, you, if you manage the easy, you can actually start anticipating the difficult part of it. So, for example, people might argue and say, can you, can you predict tsunami? Now, in the last 10, 15 years, we have actually gone to the point where we can, can actually say the tsunami is going to hit at this point in time. Can you predict an earthquake? You may not be able to predict when it will come. We all know about right, the big one, the San Francisco uh, story there. The big one, nobody knows when it will come, but, but if you look at all the tectonic plates and all the seismological studies, it will come one day. It, does, it, does it bother people? It doesn't bother seven million people who live in that area, right? The point is, we have developed the science to grow around the threat level and make sure that we have enough uh, mechanism available. This is my favorite, one of my favorite books, I think which still continues to be one of the best books on change management, um, Who Moved My Cheese? And there's a beautiful uh, passage from there that I'd like to quote here. So, so, so when the cheese is over in station C and these guys are figuring out what to do, Ham and Haw are, are really figuring out, what they learn is noticing small changes early help you adapt to the bigger changes that are yet to come. So guess what, if, uh, those who have read the book can relate to it more. But, but if, you are, if you are used to eating the same uh, cheese uh, every day and suddenly one day the cheese is over, you know what, it doesn't happen. Fred Brooks taught, about, taught to us 45 years back that how does a project get one month late? It is one day at a time, right? No project gets late 30 days in one shot. It's still one day at a time. So the fact is the changes are happening not at the scale that we believe them to be, but they are actually happening one at a time. One change at a time is really changing the world around us. And that's something that we need to... Uh, uh, we need to recognize here. Uh, so, so, so the key part is that you need to keep smelling the cheese often so that you know when it's getting old. When the, the smell is really telling you, that's the time when you know that the big change is coming there. Uh, similarly, John Carter's other book, Our Iceberg is Melting, is yet another uh, beautiful uh, parent change that we can, we can look at it. And, and here are some of them. For example, a merger acquisition or a divestiture is almost always going to be a big change, right? There will always be some change in strategy in how the, how the things are being done. There will, be, there will most likely be a change in uh, products that we are going to offer there to the market. For example, similarly, if you are creating a new product, look at iPhone. Five years back, there was no iPhone. Today, the revenues of iPhone are more than the entire business of Microsoft. How about that? Could they have anticipated this change coming from the left field? They could not have anticipated that change coming from the left field. So that's, that's something that we need to understand here. New technology can really make sure that whatever we were used to doing it uh, uh, is, is not available. Um, new legislation can actually uh, make sure that whatever uh, ways we are doing stuff is, is a new leader is another change. So a new CEO, a new uh, investor, a new key investor, new VCs there. So these are some of the changes, uh, some of the indicators of an impending change that we need to read actually and understand that it's going to change my life as I know right now. And, and, and I can't just, just say that, you know what, I, I didn't know that the change was coming. And, and I think uh, it's a fair question to say, what do I do when I don't know what lies ahead? And I think the key thing really is to turn your ignorance into curiosity. And that's, I have found, the best way of really dealing with uh, the, the, the uh, uncertainty about it. So let me start summing it up. Change is a constant and unstoppable. There's no point in fighting uh, the change. 
you 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 are i mean we all are most welcome to ignore at our peril now uh, the key is really to get up smell smell the coffee listen read network talk observe ask that's a key thing to really understand start becoming aware of what's really happening around us instead of just being uh, a passenger there prepare for the change be curious really start understanding what is happening why are we doing it why it has to be why do we need to do stand up i mean it's just somebody wrote it wrote it 10 years back in a document do i have to do stand up is it the right legitimate reason for me to do a stand up what is it try to answer it unless you understand the emotional aspect of it you are just going to do a lip service of of doing the visual uh, uh, part of that and finally i still I, i firmly believe it can be done and that's that's something which i would like to leave you with and yes um just want to leave you with one more thing i think we always blame destiny we always blame a lot of things that no i could not deal with that change but guess what i still believe that it can be done now you you got to figure out what 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 was your excuse so that's my talk thanks a lot